uh, Julian, Julian Assange has been holed up now in the rather grim and prepossessing Ecuadorian embassy for, for six months. And as I reported uh, when I saw him a couple of months ago, he wasn't looking too well even paler than we, you remember him and with a dreadful cough and uh, I know his mother has been increasingly concerned about his health. I don't know uh, if there's any good news from Julian about his circumstances but I'm also concerned about the circumstances of WikiLeaks itself because it's been in danger following the announcement by, uh, well following Visa's decision. To, to, to create a sort of barricade, a financial barricade around WikiLeaks in the hope of, uh, you know, suffocating it, I guess. And now the uh, European Commission has said uh, that the credit card company wasn't breaking the law by blocking donations. Nonetheless, health problems notwithstanding, Julian has just co-authored another book called Cyberpunk's Freedom and the Future of the Internet, and he's uh, on the blower from the aforementioned embassy in London. Julian, how are you feeling? Let's start with your health. You know, you feel it, it all seems a bit um, remarkable and dramatic when I, I hear things summed up that way, but I've gotten rather rather used to everything that's happening. Um, but you do have well, a chronic I, lung, lung infection, Julian, don't you? Well, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily go that far, but it, the circumstances are, are difficult. I'm not denying that they're difficult. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I've been in, been in worse positions. Uh, solitary confinement was worse. Uh, two years under house arrest, going to the uh, police station every day at a certain time, the manacle around my leg was worse, and other people uh, associated with our organisation are in uh, have been in considerably. Uh, worst positions. The last two weeks, Bradley Manning, uh, one of our alleged sources, has been um, fighting the US military over their treatment of him, um, where he was detained, or well, he has been detained for 928 days so far without trial. That's the longest uh, detention without trial in US military history uh, of a soldier, uh, where he was put in. Um, Tiger cages in Kuwait, um, eight by eight by eight cages in a, in a tent in Kuwait, where they altered his um, environment such that the lights went on at 11 p.m. Uh, and off at 2 p.m. in order to destabilize him. This is what's been coming out in these um, remarkable hearings uh, uh, the past two weeks, uh, where they took his glasses off, where they stripped him naked. Uh, all the sorts of things we normally associate with the interrogation regime uh, against alleged some ex Qaeda, but in this case, uh, done to a US soldier, this type of uh, no touch torture that the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Juan Mendez, investigating his case, uh, formally found against the United States, saying that his treatment uh, was equivalent to torture. When I, when I saw you, Julian, you were terribly concerned by what you were calling economic censorship and the fact that uh, WikiLeaks had, was losing you know, about 95% of the donations flow it, it, it had had, thanks to the blockade imposed in December 2010. Any good news there? Well, there's a, there's a lot of interesting news. Um, this blockade is, I suppose, if you go back and... and pull back and look at uh, what WikiLeaks has taught us about the world, well, it's not just our publications, it's the reaction, ongoing reaction to those publications, showing how modern censorship is practiced uh, in the West. And, you know, the, uh, their attempts to get up as new legislation in uh, the US Congress to turn us all into terrorists where we could be taken out extrajudicially. Uh, that didn't succeed. There was an attempt to um, activate the U.S. Treasury and blockade us like Cuba is blockaded in a formal blacklist. Uh, that didn't succeed. The guidance threw it out on the 13th of January 2011. So none of the formal mechanisms succeeded. Instead, um, uh, Lieberman and Peter T. King, uh, reactionary figures uh, in Congress and the Senate, uh, went behind the scenes um, and worked their networks in Washington and managed to get 
Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Bank of America, Western Union, MasterCard, uh, Diners Club, Discover, Moneybookers, etc., uh, to erect this extrajudicial, extraterritorial uh, financial blockade against us. And we took a case against it uh, in Iceland, where one of our bank accounts is, and won that case. Visa uh, has appealed it uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, we've filed now, just recently, another case against it in Denmark, and it's listed um, to be heard in, in the Danish courts. We've taken a, an 18 months investigation against it um, at the European Commission, and the preliminary finding is uh, they may be able to get away with that under European uh, trust law. The European Parliament, uh, just two weeks ago, however, has now passed a resolution for the Commission to draft new legislation European-wide uh, to prevent uh, the credit card companies doing that to any um, European organisation. So that's a, a major advance. And we've just had um, an, another finding, a two-year fight in relation to our charitable status in um, Germany, uh, where our charitable status was attempted to be revoked as a result of political interference um, by a CDU uh, interior minister in Hessen. Um, that came out into Spiegel uh, just a, m a month ago, this political interference, uh, but we've won. Um, and now we have EU-wide tax deductibility. And in the United States, where more than 40% of our donations um, came from, uh, there's a, a new initiative which un unfortunately has been delayed by just a couple of days. I can't tell you exactly what it is. Uh, but uh, there's a new... Um, foundation that has been created uh, with Daniel Ellsberg and other luminaries on the board uh, that is going to give us US-wide charitable status. I understand the uh, European Commission released statements from uh, Gillard as well as Joe Lieberman and that these were crucial in getting that financial blockade to happen. So our Prime Minister was not much help to you. That's right. Ma I mean, MasterCard Australia has admitted previously that Gillard was involved in relation to MasterCard Australia, that they took those statements of the Prime Minister as um, licence to uh, justify their blockade. Uh, but what we saw in the European Commission documents uh, is that Visa and MasterCard are using Gillard's statement uh, as the second statement in their compendium um, of statements by politicians. Uh, as the reason to impose the blockade um, internationally. So that's uh, Visa MasterCard uh, uh, US. Now, there's an ex a really interesting thing that's come out of the Commission in relation to these card companies. So if you think about it, nearly everyone has a Visa MasterCard in their pocket, and it is uh, the world's uh, largest um, small transaction currency. So if we wanted to exclude land purchases and oil deals and so on. Uh, Visa uh, and MasterCard together, for instance, uh, had a 97% uh, duopoly uh, in the European market. But what do we really know about how these uh, companies work? Well, there's, there's, <clears throat> there's no sovereignty in any nation without economic sovereignty. And Visa and MasterCard can simply... Uh, exercise an extrajudicial, extraterritorial economic drone strike against any Australian corporation uh, or uh, European corporation and cut it off, just um, delete it from economic existence, uh, which is what they've tried to do with us. And there's no administrative um, or judicial process uh, so far uh, that can stop it, even if you win them. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, and how it's set up in Australia mirrors the European Union is that there is a MasterCard Australia, there is a there is a Visa Europe, Visa Europe which is registered uh, here in London. But these are just fictions. It's what the European Commission has come to call a uh, network of undertakings. So the, the ownership structure is completely divorced from the control structure. Normally we think of a company or a network of companies, if you look to see who owns it, you can just sort of follow the, follow the money in terms of ownership. Uh, and you'll understand who controls what. Uh, but these companies are constructed in such a way where the control structure is mediated through secret contracts. Nominally, Visa Europe and MasterCard 
Australia are owned by Australian banks or European banks that actually they're controlled in terms of who they do business with uh, from the United States. I um, have to ask you this. Uh, any ongoing conversations with Sweden on the, you know, in the hope of getting that assurance that you wouldn't be extradited to the US? Sweden have refused to offer any such assurance. The Ecuadorian government has formally uh, requested of them that they offer a diplomatic assurance that I not be extradited to the United States. They have refused. The UK also legally has an ability to, uh, if it extradited me to Sweden, to demand that the Swedes not onwards extradite me. Um, to, uh, the, the UK government has refused. It, it is the nature of these states that they will never, ever formally uh, say no to... Uh, anything that might infuriate the United States, that's, that's, my, that's my opinion. However, um, there are developments in Sweden that, that are extremely beneficial, I think, uh, politically, and that the Swedish case is likely to be dropped uh, in the first six months of next year. That's my take on things. Um, one of the principal uh, characters involved is politician Claes Borgström. Uh, who resurrected the case uh, in Sweden one month out from the election. He was running for uh, Minister for Justice for the equivalent of the Swedish, Swedish Labour Party. Uh, he is now embroiled in the worst judicial scandal in modern Swedish history. Uh, the case of uh, Thomas Quick, and emails have come out that they're called Quicky Leaks, which are all about how Claire Borgson has been corresponding since August with a Supreme Court judge uh, trying to frame uh, one of his clients who was falsely uh, sentenced for eight murder convictions across six separate murder trials. Under international law, Australia has the right, at least the right, to take up the claim of one of its nationals where the nationals' rights have been violated under international law and assert those rights against another country. Tell me that there are ongoing negotiations with Australia on your behalf. I mean, it's very interesting to see how these things play out. So before I was in this situation, I often heard of some Australian in trouble overseas and then you have the foreign minister coming out and saying how much they're helping them, etc. Uh, this is nearly always a lie. And I know from direct experience and a few other Australians like McCall, um, who was trapped in Egypt, uh, a journalist there, uh, who in, in fact received very little assistance. In his case, he did get some at the very end and everything was cleared up. Uh, in my case, the last thing that's happened is that the government, the Ecuadorian government in Quito was contacted by uh, the Australian Foreign Affairs Office and said, oh, we're uh, concerned about Julian's health. What's your emergency program? You know, if something happens to him, uh, we can perhaps give money, we can advise, etc. And the Quito government said, fine, OK, let's set up, set up an appointment here in London. So the consul here from this embassy, a uh, very nice man uh, by the name of Fidel, met with the Australian consul to London uh, at the Australian High Commission. And uh, what was the result of that? The result of that was that the Australian government uh, gave a list of numbers for doctors in the London area. That was all that they would do. Um, there was no, uh, they had offered to, to pay bills, they had offered to do various things. Mm. Uh, none of that actually eventuated. So there had been some shift um, within uh, foreign affairs or within cabinet uh, between those two points. But of course it infuriated uh, the Ecuadorians that they had been run around uh, to all these meetings and the result of which is that we received a list of doctors which, in all um, advisability, I should never, ever have anything to do with. Julian, long before you were born, I vividly recall another famous uh, long-term incumbent in an embassy, and that, of course, was uh, the Hungarian Catholic Cardinal Menzenti, who spent 15 years from 56 to 71 under the protection of the US embassy in Budapest. You must, from time to time, see yourself following in his footsteps. Well, look, Phil, the, the position here is difficult. On the other hand, uh, we must understand that the position faced by the organisation and its supporters is also difficult. 
and there are bigger, you know, bigger political. Um, there are bigger interests at play, uh, not just um, against us, but also uh, people who support what we're doing. And the position I have here means that we're able to effectively focus some attention on what the organisation is going through, but also on the principles that we believe in. So I don't see um, my situation here as, as altogether unhelpful. Uh, the big threat that I personally face is the ongoing US investigation. Um, as of December last year, the FBI portion of that alone, and there are over a dozen US agencies involved, uh, has come out in open court that it is more than 42,135 uh, pages so far, and uh, less than 9,000 of those uh, relate to the Bradley Manning case. The rest are uh, other, other aspects of my activities and the organization's activities. Uh, we've discovered a tender that was put out by the uh, Department of Justice. It's some great work done by our people looking at these little details. The tender put out this year for a WikiLeaks uh, case management system of one to two million dollars. So that's what they're spending just on a computer system to manage the case notes for the prosecution uh, to come on September 28th. The Pentagon formally renewed its threats to us uh, through its spokesperson to ABC News, saying that well, we, our publications were an ongoing crime, an ongoing illegal activity before law enforcement. And us as an organization simply requesting uh, submissions from the US military, just the request, they call it solicitation, uh, was an ongoing crime. So not only material that we previously published about Iraq uh, revealing the deaths of 100,000 people or Afghanistan, they say was a crime, but actually the very heart of the organization, its ongoing existence, they say, is a continuous crime. Oh dear. Julian, it's good to talk to you. We haven't got time on this occasion to discuss the new book, but it's, uh, it's, uh, the book is quite remarkable and perhaps we can resume our conversation early in the new year. Incidentally, I understand that uh, there's an Ecuadorian national election coming up and both the US and the UK are concerned there's a bit of a waiting game. Well, that's what our insiders say in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office here, that the UK has been advised by the US don't do anything until after the Ecuadorian election. And uh, some reports have come out that the US has increased its um, anti-Korea uh, funding for the various aid agencies it has um, operating in Ecuador to 87 million at tripling after the Chavez um, win. Uh, however, uh, President Correa, uh, the last poll put him at 52%. Um, that's 32 points ahead of his nearest competitor. So a a com comfortable margin, Julian. Yeah. yeah, he's the most popular. He is the most popular leader in Latin America. And as of um, last year, I'm not sure the up-to-date polls, he was the second most popular Democratic, uh, the elected leader in the world. I'm now going to ludicrously suggest that you have a happy Christmas. Julian, thanks for talking to me. Julian Massage, founder, editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, now, of course, the world's most uh, famous refugee in the Ecuadorian embassy in London.